with my co-host sidekick Triple B. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing this morning? Uh, afternoon, <laughs> rather. It feels like morning to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it feels like evening to me, so I think we're both in flux. All that crazy um, solar eclipse energy from yesterday is still floating around and be here for the next six months or so. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, what's on the agenda for today's show? The agenda for today's show is something that I ripped off from your morning show. <laughs> so, of course. Yeah, it just sounded interesting, and you didn't have enough time to do it, you know, in your particular show. And I thought it was just too interesting to let pass by. So, we are going to be talking about creation. Yes, the beginning where everything originated. <laughs> yes, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> well, in this case, which came first, the heavens, the earth, the stars, whatever the case may be. But we're going to be talking a little bit about that, the spiritual value and content of each. And as we know it, every culture everywhere in every point in time has a creation story to tell. Mm -hmm. So always something somewhere. So what I am going to do is have us kick off the show with Triple P reading his uh, creation information and then we may stop a few places you know to get in a few words but other than that we're just gonna take in the information and uh, see what we get all right so when I did this article on the morning show it came from uh, pocket i'm going to pull up the i'm going to read from the original article from not nautilus is what it's called uh this is written by barry powell uh, it was actually written two years ago oh, powell okay powell sorry uh in some ways the history of science is the history of a philosophical resistance to mythical explanations of reality in the ancient world when we asked where did the world come from we were told creation myths, and in the modern world, we are instead told a convincing scientific story. The Big Bang Theory, first proposed in 1927 by the Belgian Roman Catholic priest Georges Lemaitre, not exactly sure how you say that name, is based on observations that galaxies appear to be flying apart from one another, suggesting that the universe is expanding. We trace this movement back in space and time to nearly the original point of the explosion, mm. the single original atom from which all the universe emerged 14 billion years ago. Wow. <clears throat> now, while it is based on empirical measurement and quantitative reasoning, it is also still a creation story and shares some of the traits of the stories that have come before. For one thing, it resonates with the ethos of the modern age. That is the era of big explosions, like those in White Sands and over Nagasaki. Also, like all creation stories, it explains in comprehensible language something which otherwise requires unobtainable categories of thought. After all, we cannot really know what the world was like before its creation, obviously, because we didn't exist yet. <laughs> Well, we were somewhere, just not here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we do see how things around us change, grow, are born, and die. And like the ancients, we fashion these observations into the story of our creation. So before I get into the next section, do you want any add any thoughts to that harmony? Well, I think the biggest thing about creation itself is the fact that, one, there's so many different diverse stories. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about, you know, the mythological, well, 
the one thing that keeps over playing in my mind and playing over in, in my mind is science and magic. Mm, yeah. You know, they both prove each other. You can't make that crap up. You know, so the science is there to back up certain factors, but also the, the magic, you know, the, the, the realm of the occult plays a huge part in the creation stories as well. So those two literally go hand in hand. I mean, you can take a group of scientists and they're, you know, these nerdy guys <laughs> that, you know, have their opinions on how everything was was pulled together and, you know, exactly scientific. Well, you take another batch and they're not just the nerdy guys that are scientists. They're the ones that do believe in the magic of the making of the universe. Mm-hmm. And it's true. Um, the other thing that calls to me in this article is when they say how everything was moving away from each other in, in reality or whatever perceived reality is, it's expanding. Mm-hmm. So this is how I guess in our spiritual context would say our consciousness expands mm-hmm. because as our consciousness is able to evolve and open more and bring more into it we're able to soak up more as our our little sponge brains do <laughs> when we yeah. expand the universe expands and we also have some other things we'll get into later about Norse mythology because I found that to be very interesting when I was reading their creation story because it sounds uh, pretty viable you know and viable and when we say it was all started from one atom A-T-O-M A-D-E-M or A-M Adam as in Adam and Eve why do you think he was called the Adam? <laughs> think about yeah, that good, good. Good point there. Bend that mind. Bend, let that bend your brain for a little <laughs> bit. And let's get on to the next section. All right. So we're going to go back in time to the oldest creation myth. According to Nautilus, the oldest creation myth on the planet from perhaps 2600 BC was given as a preface to a Sumerian poem about the descent of Galgamesh's friend and Kidu into the underworld. Galgamesh. Yeah. Um, The account begins after heaven had been moved away from earth, after earth had been separated from heaven, after the name of man had been fixed, after Anne had uh, carried off heaven, after Enlil had carried off Ki. At some time, the myth tells us heaven and earth were united and then they were separated. The separation of sky and earth made possible the appearance of man. The poem introduces us to elements that we see repeated again and again in ancient myths. First, creation was not from nothing, which you never find in ancient myth, but from something that was already there. What was it? Well, in a tablet listing, the Samaritan gods... The Sumerian gods, excuse me. <laughs> Not Samaritan. You're a good Samaritan hostile, <laughs> The goddess uh, Namu is said to be the mother who gave birth to heaven and earth, and her name is written as a sign that means the sea. Second, the act of naming and spoken language is deeply mixed into the act of creating. Man is created only after his name had been fixed. And we see these two elements used in the pyramid texts, which come from Egypt around the year 2300 BC, and are the oldest religious texts in the world, and some of the oldest texts of any kind. They refer to the creation of the world in order to guarantee the vigor of the glorified king buried in an artificial primeval hill. On this hill, Atum, (laughs) A-T-U-M, another spelling, (laughs) the creator god took his stand O atom kepper you who were on high on the primeval hill you did arise as the ben bird of the ben stone in the ben house in heliopolis you did spit out what was shu you did sputter out what was tefnut 
You did put your arms around them as the arms of a Ka, for your Ka was in them. Atum, the complete one, is the sun god, always the great god in Egypt, the principle of unified creative power. Keper, the scarab, means the becoming one, hence the principle of generation, a force for change and progress. The creation is imagined as an event, like when the bent bird, our word phoenix through the Greek, bursts suddenly, astoundingly, from the reeds. Then the Ben bird alights on top of the primeval mound, symbolized in Egyptian architecture as the obelisk in the Temple of the Sun, in the City of the Sun, Heliopolis, near modern Cairo. And that's what the moment of creation was like to the ancient Egyptians. Of course, Adam Kepper uh, is still all alone on the primeval mound, so he spits out air, or shoe, and sputters out moisture, or tefnut, the first duality, the source of all that is. The Egyptian is punning on shoe and tefnut, which sounds like spit and sputter in Egyptian. <laughs> then he puns again because the Egyptian hieroglyph for ka, which might translate as vital force, are two upraised arms, and this ka, Adam Kepper placed in shoe and tefnut. What do you think? Well... And here's the interpretation. Helios, prefix, sun. Heli, helio, sun god, yeah. yes. And the sun, all the ancient Egyptians, of course, were sun worshippers. The sun is the central sun also. Um, and in basically, we would be looking at the masculine form of. And when we're talking about Ka, and wrapping the arms around the Ka, we're talking about the Merkaba, which is your chariot. The Merkaba is your aura, which you can wrap your arms around. Or maybe not so much, because it's pretty big some days. <laughs> but it's talking about your Merkaba, which is your own personal chariot, as they would call it. And the sputtering of the air and this and that basically what we're looking at is in very raw context and no pun intended since yeah Ra was one of the Egyptian gods <laughs> that's where they got Amen oh, from wow. because his name was Amen Ra um, for the most part what we're looking at is the very rough crude um, first lookings of what we would call the pillar of light and if anybody out there has ever studied metaphysics or the um, uh, hermetic tradition, the pillar of light is basically taking your energy, okay, so you're standing up straight, you stretch your arms up to the heavens, and you anchor your feet down to the ground. What you're doing is you're not just sputtering, but what you're doing <laughs> is you are waving your energy. What you're doing is you're grounding your feet deeply to the center of Mother Earth's crystal heart. And you are anchoring yourself within that stability within her. And then what you're doing is you are reaching to the heavens to draw the energy down through you to her. So this exercise is called the pillar of light and it's something you can do daily. It's really good for grounding. It's really good for pulling yourself together. You're taking in the God energy or the etheric or air energy through your crown, through your, your hands and fingertips. And you're drawing that down through your crown, through your body as a conduit to your giant straw. And you take that energy and you see it go all the way down to the crystalline heart of Mother Earth and it feeds her. And then you take it from her again, piping it back through your channel, up and out through the crown, getting up back into the etheric level, and then you just keep doing it until you see it going faster. Now, if you're a real expert and you know about your chakras and the colors and all that, 
you can see your body kind of lighting up in the different colors as you bring the energy up and down your 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 straw your tube mm -hmm. but your uh your merkaba is always around you which is your your aura the phoenix would be the energy which rises of course to the air it's basically like the rebirthing connection it is the bringing up of energy it is the you know leaving everything behind dying to the old coming into the new states of awareness and consciousness so it seems like the egyptians here had a lot of <laughs> have a lot <laughs> of um have a lot of things happening in the sense of where they really truly knew what was going on and i really believe that we did have as we still do today our extraterrestrial beings that are among us helping aiding us at times um and back then i believe as they said the pyramids and when they were built this is a little side note i think it's interesting that they say that even uh, the lasers and equipment of technology that we have today could not even replicate or make the pyramids as perfect as they were made then you can't even yeah. fit a razor through any of that i will say like there is some unfortunate backstory behind how the pyramids were made i mean there was slavery and things like that involved well, yeah. but they were so particular about the details of their pyramid and how they were built that they are they're really grand structures like the, even modern day architect cannot compare to the structures of those pyramids and the thing that i find so interesting about the whole situation is that if you look at the hieroglyphs that they have it talks about how beings from the sky came to help them make these structures mm -hmm. and the way that they were built according to the hieroglyphs was that there was frequency involved a lot mm -hmm. of people believe and it shows in some of the in some of the pyramids on the walls in those hieroglyphs the blocks being levitated mm -hmm. the theory speculation is that they were using frequencies in order to levitate those blocks into place how else could it have been done I not you tell me that before and then what mm -hmm. makes what makes the pyramids even more amazing is that if you think the pyramids are amazing to look at on the outside you haven't seen the inside of them because if I recall correctly a lot of the pyramids were resting grounds for the pharaohs that yes. passed away from yes. ancient Egypt yeah. and the inside of those had uh, very elaborate labyrinths and other things um, they they contained a lot of the pharaoh's uh, precious belongings and things like that as well that meant a lot to those mm -hmm. pharaohs different chambers and the fact that they're mm -hmm. facing in specific directions with specific mathematical coordinates mm -hmm. it's also been said that they are anchors to the earth that they were put there for the energetic bonding that occurs in that area for instance there is a certain time every year certain day certain time that i believe it's when leo crosses the sun that the sun shines directly in the center of the paws of the phoenix oh wow yes it hits a certain spot every single year on a specific date perfectly can't make that up that reminds me of a structure that we have in the united states obviously not as impressive but <laughs> uh, there's a there's a structure uh some sort of you know those windows that you see in church that that uh you know are colorized Stained and that's glass. the sun yeah, yeah. the sun shines in it produces some cool light effects on the ground and things like that yeah there's some structures that are built i forget where they are i think it's washington dc if i'm not mistaken that um there's a certain time during the year that the sign the sun shines perfectly through these structures and creates uh some sort of governmental seal or something on the ground as a reflection interesting mm. so very interesting but obviously that this is more modern times and 
this happened years and years ago. So centuries. Very yeah. yeah, centuries ago. Back in the times of the ancients. But yeah, I mean that's the little side note to this particular with a little extra side note is the, the pyramids themselves. But as we continue on our creation story. Yeah, I think we uh, we're at our first break of okay. the show. So when we come back, we're going to talk more about those uh, Egyptian puns that we mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're also going to talk about how the how these puns connect with the spoken language and the naming uh, methodology behind um, Egypt and the act of creationism. So we'll be back on Harmonic Connections in just a couple of minutes on WWSU 106.9 FM. with me harmony and triple p hello hello and we are getting our uh, egyptian fix on here with our creation story basically talking today about creation stories that have come from egypt and possibly some other places you know we all have these stories in every culture as i said earlier Mm -hmm. and i just find them fascinating i really do because you know, I've studied spirituality and metaphysics for years. I am, like, by no means, <laughs> you know, somebody that, that knows 100% of everything. You know, we all still learn, and I still always learn myself. Mm-hmm. But it's just amazing to me how, you know, what we've already talked about, how it's hit me, and how you piece things together in your mind you know things that you have read and things that come to you on a daily that you're like oh you know hey that's something that sounds like this yeah so but continuing on with what we have here let's see what we got so before the break and in our previous section we mentioned several uh words that the egyptians use that uh, sound very punny (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to talk about the act of naming and spoken language, which is deeply mixed into the act of creating, especially in the culture of Egypt. Yeah, especially since if you look all the way back and if you're a Bible person, which is, you know, whichever good for interesting things as well. If you look in the Bible, when God created the earth as the story goes, and we're just saying, yes, story, um he basically called forth things by a frequency or vibration Mm -hmm. so i just want to throw that in there for the sake of because that's very crucial yeah because when you look at the universe the universe is created largely on a principle of colors frequencies and geometric shapes and they appear absolutely everywhere not only on our planet but out and beyond in the universe so all right take it away triple p just had to get that in there all right this is from nautilus um so those puns that we were mentioned they're not funny and well (laughs) they might be funny but there is significance behind them right in the resemblance of words to one another lie the deepest secrets of the universe yes so uh this was according to the egyptians We are reminded both of the power of naming in the Sumerian story and of the power of common mathematical forms. We just talked about it. (laughs) Isn't that amazing how that happens? Like we said, guys, cannot make that stuff up. So in modern physics, to point us to the deep realities of nature, the children of Shu and Tefnut are Geb, Earth, and Nut, Sky, uh, just as an ancient Sumer. And like an ancient Sumer, the moment of the universe's creation consists of one thing becoming two through the agency of the mouth. Even in as in the Sumerian account, man is spoken into existence. Again, we are reminded of the creation of matter and antimatter at the moment of the Big Bang, 
which we expected to be created in equal proportions, but were not, making for an outstanding puzzle in modern cosmology. Yes. For most Westerners, the most familiar myth of the creation, even on a canonical account, is verses 1 through 8 in Genesis. It is therefore hard to hear the words in their original meanings. An examination of the opening lines of the Hebrew text, however, reveal parallels with the creation myth of ancient Mesopotamia. So it goes, In the beginning, when Elohim created the heaven and the earth, the earth was a formless and unbounded mass, with darkness covering its fluid chaos and with a wind from Elohim sweeping over it. Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. Elohim saw the goodness of the light and separated it from the darkness. The light he called day and the darkness night. Thus evening and morning came to being, a complete day. Then Elohim said, Let there be a partition in the middle of the watery chaos, spreading out to separate the waters. So it came about, and the partition divided the waters below it from those above. Elohim called the partition sky. So in the Mesopotamian and Egyptian accounts, the great elements of nature are gods, whereas in the monotheistic Hebrew account, the powers that made the world are stripped of personal names and attributes. Elohim is a plural form meaning gods, but it seems in the context to refer to a single god. It's usually translated God, capital G-O-D. The usage probably descends from a time when there were many gods. Again, we see that in the beginning, heaven and earth were together. The Hebrew word for wind is uh, ruach, which, like Greek uh, pneuma and Latin spiritus, may mean air in motion, breath, or psychological power. Mm -hmm. In polytheistic systems, the ruach is Enlil, god of the storm, who separated heaven from earth. In Egypt, it was Shu, or Air, who separated Geb from Nut in representations in many Egyptian papyri. As in Sumer, creation in the biblical account is by speech. Night and day are called into being, just as the Sumerian account refers to the time after the name of man had been fixed. Once again, to name is to call into existence. As in Sumer, creation is by separation. There is a partition, literally something solid, in the middle of the watery chaos. So pause there. Yeah, which I find really interesting because when we get down to the spiritual core value of what we're reading now, what we're looking at is, of course, I would always begin to say, and mind you, these are my opinions only, you know, they don't reflect the university, the station, or any other of the entities that are here. But these are my opinions and ideas and and formations. But the thing about it is, we're looking at the Hebrew, and I would also say looking at the Greek, you know, uh, Bibles. To me, you know, I feel like those are, quote unquote, the ancient texts. You know, those are the total mechanics of absolutely everything. Not Mm -hmm. only are they giving you the stories of creation, they're also giving you a more magical, mystical feel of the truth that, you know, underlies everything else. So we're talking about, you know, not just the magic of life, we're talking about the occult. No, I don't mean that in a bad way either. When people hear the word occult, they flip and think, oh, Satan! But no, that's not what we're talking about here. The Christian Bibles, the, you know, New Testament, King James and all that, those were like way later. But when you're getting down, you know, if you look at the Hebrew Bible, it is written completely different. Punctuation is like hardly non-existent. And, you know, it gives you much more of a mystical attribute. And we're looking at the tree of life. We're looking at the Kabbalah. You know, some people say the, you know, Kabbalah, the Kabbalah. We're talking about the Merkabah, which we've already, you know, discussed earlier on. And when we're looking at what the word we just looked at was the, let's see, Spiritos. 
was spirit is I think mentioned. yeah I think it was spirit <clears throat> is. when we're looking at that Greek word and it says spirit is. oh that's Latin my yeah, bad so Latin. Same, uh, pneuma is the Greek one. Same thing here. Yeah. Latin, Greek, it's all European. But for the most part, when we look at that word, that to me indicates, okay, hey guys, yes, we are the breath. The breath is what gives each person life. Also, not only life, but it's soul. Soul also, if you look at the word psyche or psychic, also means soul. It basically is telling us that we need to, you know, in my opinion here, connect with our soul, connect with our breath. This is where meditation comes in. This is where going to your inner core comes in. This is going into the truth and reality of who you are as a person. Sure, you're human. You're wearing your human costume, whichever one you pulled out of the uh, heavenly closet to come here as. But the real core of your being is your soul essence and your breath. There is an electromagnetic force that resonates within each of us. And when we die and that force leaves the body, the body is no longer animated. Therefore, we are that eternal presence. This is where the uh, you know, eternal concepts come in that never dies. You can never take that away from anyone. Sure, you can take the body away. Yeah, maybe you'll reincarnate into something different. Maybe, hey, I want a size 10 costume next time. Or uh, <laughs> I would rather have this or that. But the point remains is the fact that there are many different words that are indicators that tell us the spiritual value of what is really there underlying underneath everything in the world and us as people you know we are always remembering who we are a lot of people you know I would say great contemplators probably you know jump in on that and contemplate but I feel like the average person you know is not going to sit there and bend their mind around subjects like this and that's exactly why I have this show to provoke thoughts to stimulate the soul the psyche you know to to tickle the heart space to know where we our origins you know really came from but you know these are very interesting concepts to me because you know there are some people that feel these things at a deeper core level so um for the most part you piece it all together and that's why I decided to do this show today because it's like a giant puzzle and it definitely was like all falling into the perfect places and I just felt like I had to do it so I hope some of you out there get it I hope some of you are following along with it and that you you investigate it further if it you know sparks an interest mm -hmm. but onward all right, so to conclude the Nautilus article, why does the sea feature so prominently in Sumer and Judeo-Christian myth? We take from what we see around us and suppose that the universe is governed by the same processes. Human babies are born in a sack of water, and of course, all sorts of things emerge from the sea. <laughs> the sea is formless and dark and mysterious and hence an excellent symbol for the conditions that logic tells us must have existed before creation. Today we look into the shapeless, formless sky for our creation story, but not the sea. For the layperson, the naming of the process discovered by science, Big Bang, is in some ways the content and comfort of the story. Um, even as science reveals new layers of our reality, creation stories remain just that. Stories giving us explanations and comprehensible language of something which otherwise requires unobtainable categories of thought. And that was written by Barry B. Powell. And the last piece there also brings a really big interest. Water. We are all born in an ambiotic sack filled full of what? Water. Liquid, yeah. 
And while you are bobbing around in your mama's tummy in that liquid, in that soup of the uh, cosmos, which it truly is, it's a miraculous place, I'm sure. Water is a conductor. What is it a conductor of, guys? It is a conductor of electricity. It is a conductor of psychic ability, fluid, emotion, psychic perception. Basically, the water is an information system. So when we immerse ourselves, this is why like baptism is always brought up. What are we baptized in? Water. Water. <laughs> um, what do we do every morning? Hopefully, if you're a hygienic person. Shower. Yes, and what is, comes out of the shower? Hopefully water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or scorpions like that one horse look I saw one day. That'd be crazy. But um, oh, no, water has always been a very psychic element. It's cleansing, it's healing, it's expansive, it's formless, shapeless, much like the sky. You know, we are a drop, one drop, each of us, in that sea of the universal fluid. That from which was just one little atom, as they say, has grown into matter, it's grown into a shape. It has been given a name. It is fixed. You know, we've all came from something, the water, the land. We're all the elements. If you look at what our bodies are comprised of and you look at the chemical, you know, chart of uh, elements, you know, we have copper, we have magnesium, we have potassium, we have carbon, hydrogen, we have you know, sulfur, we, we have, we are everything. We are our own little universe mm -hmm. incarnate. We are pieces of everything out there. We are pieces of stars. We are star seeds. I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard that and have followed that on the internet with the, you know, different, um, you know, races of the stars and nations of the stars as the native americans would call them but we are all elements we we are all of this and i think that's where the thing that people you know a lot of people don't identify with that because they don't think about it but if you're into studies of spirituality and, and things like this you're going to think about that of how miraculous it truly is you're going to think of how magical it is to know that you are a part of the heavens. You're a part of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. You know? And how exciting, honestly, that is. I mean, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously. If you really think about it, you yeah. Know? There's a lot that goes into it. Exactly. And, you know, it's it always was said, you know, that you don't question the Bible. You don't question you know these concepts but you know in this century we question everything right obviously that's how you expand your knowledge exactly. that's how we expand our own internal universe of our consciousness exactly <laughs> you know so it's no longer this big secret that we're not supposed to know about and be stupid to you know we're we are very intelligent beings you know Sometimes not all of us use that intelligence, mm -hmm. but you know, we are very intelligent beings and there is a lot there to learn to understand as we grow, the universe grows. I'm apparently not intelligent enough to screw on a cap without dropping it. There you go. <laughs> uh, You're not intelligent enough to uh, spread love and not all the crazy crap that's going on in the world right now, but you know, it's, it's, it's like a breakdown of the system. We need to find a better way to do absolutely everything. Mm. Oh. Because the old way doesn't work anymore. Yeah. We see that. Revolution. <laughs> Revolution. All right. It's time for our second break on the show. What's coming up after we return? Well, I think we might just have some closing thoughts and possibly a very brief meditation of the cosmos. All right, we will be back in just a couple of minutes on Harmonic Connection on WWSU 106.9 FM. Choice. And 
and welcome back to the Harmonic Connection with me, Harmony, and Triple P. And we are in the last leg of our show today, and we've been talking about creation, creation stories of Egypt, my personal ideas and opinions on the flow, of the spirituality, some of these concepts, and finishing off of the day, there's just one more thing of interest, at least I thought, and it was about the Norse mm -hmm. uh, creation story, which I was reading one day, and it was just like dinging in my head, like, wow, man, this sounds just so, like, true. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about it so i'm gonna have triple p here read a little bit of what we have we'll do a you know little brief back and forth on it and then we'll get into um you know just a brief cosmos meditation to end the day um hopefully we'll have time for the meditation because there's there is quite a few sections here in the well, norse creation myth I, I think it might be short maybe not so much a meditation as just some words of contemplation. How about that? Yeah, there yeah, we go. Let's do that. All right. So uh, this com the Norse creation myth comes from uh, Pitt University or Pitt.edu, uh, extracted from the Prose Edda of Snorri Sturl Sturluson, I believe is how you say it. Okay. So the first world to exist was Maspell, a place of light and heat, whose flames are so hot. That those who are not native to that land cannot endure it. Surt sits at Muspel's border, guarding the land with a flaming sword. At the end of the world, he will vanquish all the gods and burn the whole world with fire. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful, huh? Yes. Beyond Muspel lay the great and yawning void named Ginnungagap. And beyond Ginnungagap lay the dark, cold realm of Niflheim. Uh, apologies if I'm not saying some I think of these it was names correctly. Ginn Ginnengap. Ginning. Ginnengap. Ginnengap. Something like that. Ginnengap. No, it has two gag. It has two G A G A S in it. Okay. So I think it's Ginnengap. 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 <laughs> um, ice, frost, wind, rain, and heavy cold em emanated from Niflheim, meeting in Ginnengap. Ginnengap. The soft air, heat, light, and soft air from Muspel. Where heat and cold met appeared thawing drops, and this running fluid grew into a giant frost ogre named Ymir. Ymir slept, falling into a sweat. Under his left arm there grew a man and a woman, and one of his legs begot a son with the other. This was the beginning of the frost ogres. Thawing Frost then became a cow called Adhumla. Adhumla. Four rivers of milk ran from her teats and she fed Ymir. The cow, excuse me a second, there we go. The cow licked salty ice blocks and after one day of licking, she freed a man's hair from the ice. After two days, his head appeared and on the third day, the whole man was there. His name was Beery, and he was tall, strong, and handsome. Beery begot a son named Bor, and Bor married Besla, the daughter of a giant. Bor and Besla had three sons. Odin was the first, Vili was the second, and V was the third. It is believed that Odin, in association with his brothers, is the ruler of heaven and earth. He is the greatest and most famous of all men. Odin, Vili, and v, v killed the giant Ymir. When Ymir fell, there issued from his wounds such a flood of blood that all the frost ogres were drowned, except for the giant Bergelmir, who escaped with his wife by climbing onto a lure or a hollowed out tree trunk that could serve either as a boat or a coffin. From them sprang the families of frost ogres, the sons of Bor then carried Ymir to the middle of Ginnungagap and made the world from him. From his blood they made the sea and the lakes, from his flesh the earth, from his hair the trees, and from his bones the mountains. They made rocks and pebbles from his teeth and jaws, and 
those bones that were broken. Maggots appeared in Ymir's flesh and came to life. By the decree of the gods, they acquired human understanding and the appearance of men, although they lived in the earth and the rocks. From Ymir's skull, the sons of Bor made the sky and set it over the earth with its four sides. Under each corner, they put a dwarf whose names are east, west, north, and south. The sons of Bor flung Ymir's brains into the air, and they became the clouds. <laughs> I know, it was an interesting sort of uh, yeah. Then they took the sparks and burning <clears throat> embers that were flying about after they had been blown out of a spell and placed them in the midst of Gunungagap to give light to heaven above the earth beneath. To the stars, they gave appointed places and paths. The earth was surrounded by a deep sea. The sons of Bor gave lands near the sea to the families of giants for their settlements. To protect themselves from the hostile giants, the sons of Bor built for themselves an inland stronghold using Ymir's eyebrows. This stronghold they named Mid Midgard. Midgard. While walking along the seashore, the sons of Bor found two trees and from them they created a man and a woman. Odin gave the man and the woman spirit and life. Vili gave them understanding and power of movement. They gave them clothing and names. And the man was named Ask or Ash. And the woman Embla or Elm. From Ask and Embla have sprung the races of men who lived in Midgard. It sounds interesting because Ask and Embla sounds like um, Ash and Ember. Almost. Mm -hmm. And if you look Ash and Ember, and if you look in ancient text, and you hear the name of the sea as it was called in, it was Ashua. Nice. So, what we're looking at here is the creation story, mythological of the Norse tradition. And if you listen closely to this, after you've listened to the stories before of the Egyptian text, it's somewhat the same. We're talking about the elements. Fire, water, air, earth. Mm -hmm. Now, does this not sound pagan to you, Drew? It sounds very pagan to me. <laughs> yes. So, we're looking at some of the oldest spiritual text thoughts, etc. And this is where, you know, spirituality versus religion comes in. You know, is not a man-made thing. This is a spirituality thing. Religion was birthed into existence from mortal man, therefore tainted, as one would say. Mm -hmm. But in these traditions, and I, I find it kind of chilling when you listen to the first, um, you know, reading up here, when it talks about the sword and it's brought in by fire and mm -hmm. then it would be taken out by fire now I remember reading something uh, within the past couple months that was in biblical text I believe in the King James version of course and it was some prophecies of Jesus so what it had said was uh, that let's see said something about the fact that the ultimate baptism was by fire you know we have the water baptismals but it says the the real baptism is by fire it is the cleansing and the burning out which if you look at this that brings us to the Egyptian Phoenix mm -hmm. rising up from the ashes into the flames to be rebirthed and reborn so what we're talking about yet again here is a transitioning from one to the other. Hmm. Okay, my brain is cooking, yeah. but I can't go There's into some. it because of the fact that I'd be here forever and we're only <laughs> we only have so many minutes left. Yeah. But um yeah. We got um that wasn't all there was a few more uh things okay. left from the Norse. Uh, okay. One might be uh, Thor. That's a very interesting one. As people but. say, is it Thor? Yeah, it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. Thor. My Thor buttocks. 
and uh, Thor was was uh, our, our Thursday. Thursday is named after Thor. Thor's day. All right. So continuing on, um, the Norse creation in the middle of the world, the sons of Thor brought for themselves a stronghold named Asgard, called Troy by later generations. The gods and their kindred lived in Asgard, and many memorable events have happened there. In Asgard was a great hall named, oh my gosh, that is a name I don't <laughs> think I can pronounce, Hlidskalaf. It's H-L-I-D-S-K-J-A-L-F. Wow. What a name. We're just going to leave it <laughs> so we don't butcher the pronunciation. Odin sat there on a high seat, and from there he could look out over the whole world and see what everyone was doing. He understood everything that he saw. Odin married Frigg, the daughter of Fjordgvin, and from this family he had come all the kindred that inhabited ancient Asgard and those kingdoms that belonged to it. Members of this family are called the Aesir, and they are all divinities. This must be the reason why Odin is called All Father. He is the father of all the gods and men, and of everything that he and his power created. Then, the earth was Odin's daughter and his wife as well. By her, he had his first son, Thor. Might and strength were Thor's characteristics, and by these, he dominates every living creature. As all informed people know, the gods built a bridge from earth to heaven called Bilfrost. Some call it the rainbow. It has three colors and is very strong, made with more skill and cunning than any other structures. But strong as it is, it will break when the sons of Mispel ride over it. The gods are not to blame that this structure will then break. Bilfrost is a good bridge, but there is nothing in this world that can be relied on when the sons of Mispel are on their warpath. And finally, the chief sanctuary of the gods is by the ash tree, uh, Yggdrasil. There they hold the daily court. Yggdrasil is the best and greatest of all trees. It bran its branches spread out over the whole world and reach up over heaven. So we got about and, five minutes and here. And that would be known as, my children, the tree of life. Yes. Or the Kabla. And we are looking at just a bunch of food for thought today in this uh, in this very brief 50 um, minutes to almost an hour of uh, those of you that contemplate spirituality on deeper levels than most. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I know I have. And um, like I said, I, I don't know it all, but I try to piece it and string it together. And sometimes it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Other times, maybe not so much. And I've got to bang my head into the wall a few times. Hmm. But, um, you know, definitely interesting. I mean, what, what do you think, Triple P? I mean, what's your take on a lot of this? It's pretty cool to look into other cultures and see what their story is on creationism. Because even though the words may sound different and things like that, they all have a... a really close connection with each other yeah there's always some similarities you know at the core of everything because if you look it's like there's always things that you can connect to you know they are all virtually the same story told by a, a different you know time frame mm -hmm. told by you know a different perspective and that's pretty much what it is. It's all our perception. It's all our perspective. Truly, as I say, it is all the same. It's just written in different, you know, ways, shapes, and forms for, for the masses. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, no matter how it's written, no matter how many times you read it, no matter how many times you think about it, it's all the same. It's yeah. all one, which goes back to that oneness concept that we are one body, one mind, one spirit, one world, you know, one everything. And the faster that we get to know that concept and, you know, birth that and breathe that into existence, the better off this little planet will be. Mm -hmm. 
So in, in just the final moments of the show, I just leave you with that contemplation. I thank each and every one of you for showing up every Sunday. I appreciate you. And, I believe this uh, is uh, this was our last episode of the semester, so... Yeah, so there we go. Ending on a very interesting note. So. But I wish everybody very happy holidays. Yule, if you celebrate it. Happy 2022 coming up. I'm probably uh, be joining Triple P on his Christmas and New Year's shows, so mm -hmm. I will uh, be around then. But as always, thank you for being a part of my world in the Harmonic Connection. Always a pleasure. And if you need to get a hold of me for any reason, whether it's just to have that deep, winding conversation of the cosmos, or if you would like a special oil blend, bath salt, uh, or even big product now, <laughs> <laughs> you can hit me up at angelness67 at iCloud.com, and I'll be more than happy to get with you. Thanks right. for listening. I wish you all namaste and happy holidays. We'll be back on the air in one hour at 4 p.m. if anybody's interested for Meditation 1010. And since it's, since it is exam week at Red State University, I think we'll take the time to kind of talk about de-stressing and approaching the exams with clarity, with confidence, and with tranquility. Decompressing. Yes. So that will come up in just one hour on WWSU Radio. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll see you hopefully uh, maybe in January. We'll come back. <laughs> maybe so. So stick we'll around. See. We'll see.